Tim and I often remind one another about nine o'clock in the evening, uh, did you bring your tablets with you? <laughs> and uh, we have been in some very interesting meetings that have gone on and on. He did mention Board of Standards meetings that we've shared for nine years. But uh, thank you very much for a very warm introduction this evening. Certainly my privilege to be here this evening and to accept the invitation to come and to share with you some thoughts around this theme of heeding the sheep. I must say that um, this position that I find myself in tonight is not one I ever expected that would come to me. I have attended Simpson lectures on a fairly regular basis through the years and have always appreciated uh, the contributions of those who come to share at a great distance. However, I was reminded that I did come from the neighboring province and I did bring a briefcase with me, so surely I must have something to share. I'd ask for your prayers as I begin tonight as well. Uh, I mentioned earlier to Tim that this afternoon at 4 o'clock when I checked in with family, uh, our son who's 18 uh, was involved in a car accident and uh, was hospitalized but is now released from hospital and has some bruised kidneys, and so that will be monitored over the next couple of days. And uh, so those are just some of the things that uh, we must always be thinking about, I guess, as parents and in the family of faith. And it's no secret tonight that I should be um, sharing around that whole theme of pastoral care, because we live at a time of surprise, often as pastors, and events come our way, and uh, this is the time uh, that God has given to us. It's always dangerous to recognize people, but there are two individual, one individual and a group of people that I'd like to at least say hello to tonight before I begin. I'm deeply indebted tonight uh, to uh, Dr. Abner Langley, and I'm so thrilled tonight that his wife Thelma is here. Uh, Abner Langley was my pastor, my mentor, along with several others who were at Acadia at that time when I came through. So I'm so glad that Thelma's here tonight. And I'm especially glad that uh, there are members of previous congregations that I have pastored who are here tonight who will hold me true to what I had to say. And I had to say to Tim earlier, well, there goes half the illustrations I have. <laughs> <laughs> Would you share with me just a moment of quiet reflection and prayer as we prepare our hearts and our minds uh, for what we would hope God would give us tonight. Let's pray together. Our Father, we approach this topic with a sense of great dependence upon you. We thank you that you have given us guidance, wisdom from your word, inspiration by your spirit and through your people. Grant to us tonight that we might have that sense of your guidance. Challenge us. Open our hearts and our minds to new understandings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the last two evenings, we have been challenged to think around the topics of leading and feeding sheep. Tonight I want us to examine some of the implications involved from a pastoral perspective in heeding the sheep. I confess that when that topic was given to me, I had to stop and think what is really meant by heeding the sheep. The New Oxford Dictionary defines heeding in the following manner. To heed is to regard with care, to take careful notice of, to be careful to, play, to pay close attention, to be attentive. Throughout the scriptures, there is pastoral imagery of shepherds tending, minding, heeding their sheep. The loved 23rd Psalm comes to mind from the Old Testament, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And in particular, verse 5 indicates how the shepherd anoints the bruised head of the sheep with oil at the end of a long day, tending and lovingly caring for its needs. 
In the New Testament, this pastoral imagery is seen with no stronger emphasis than with the words of our Lord Jesus, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. To those who were tending God's flock, Peter said, and we heard this as Dr. Richardson brought this to mind last evening from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being an example to the flock. The Apostle Paul, in his farewell to the Ephesian elders, admonished them with these words. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Tonight I want us to focus on the leader or the pastor as the shepherd. Truly, it is not possible to compartmentalize ministry. Although we have had a lecture on leading sheep, and we've had a lecture on feeding sheep where we've given attention and primacy to the preaching or proclamation of the word, and although tonight I want us to focus on shepherding or pastoral care, there is in a very real sense um, my awareness that we cannot really <coughs> compartmentalize ministry. I believe that the pastor must learn to live with the seeming paradox of ministry. The pastor is both prophet and priest. The one who proclaims the word of God with his authority and is also the one who within the hour may be called upon to tenderly listen to the last words or the final breath of a dying saint. In my own attempts to live with this paradox, I have come to the firm conviction that in order for the prophetic word to be effective, it must be proclaimed within the priestly arena. In the tending of sheep, there is often the need for the word from the Lord. But it must be offered with the grace and with the love of Christ from the heart and from the mind of the shepherd. The pastor also must function well in the administrative arena, providing effective visionary leadership. I would remind myself and pastors to always remember that only Jesus was prophet, priest, and king. The paradox of ministry is that pastors need to provide wise and strong administrative leadership and they must effectively proclaim the word of God while at the same time remembering that the calling includes the pastoral care of sheep as well. Sheep who will respond to the shepherd's voice and follow when they are convinced that the shepherd has their best interests at heart. Sheep who will respond and follow when they are convinced that the shepherd has their best interests at heart. The Apostle Paul's words to the elders of the church at Ephesus command our attention. The authorized King James Version renders these words, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, the New International Translation is as follows. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock. As surely as there are clear admonishments in Scripture for the care of the sheep, there is also the strong word that shepherds must keep watch and take care of themselves. There are four major emphases in this lecture for those of you who will be counting. Each emphasis is a word to the shepherd, and each emphasis could form the topic of a single lecture. 
but I'm going to attempt to at least highlight what I believe are four areas with regard to providing a kind of ministry as a shepherd that will glorify God and that will help sheep. The first word is, guard your own life. <coughs> Taken from this passage of scripture, Acts 20:28. 20, keep watch over yourselves. Guard your own life. The injunction to guard your own life includes many areas. Guard your life as it relates to your private life. Guard your life as it relates to your family, to your friendship circle. I want us to focus on two areas when it comes to guarding your own life. Your identity as a person and your identity as a pastor or as a shepherd are the two areas that I want us to focus on. Questions of how well do you know yourself and how well do you understand your gifting for ministry come to my mind. Some of you may have participated in a little exercise where you were given a piece of paper and told to answer a question, who are you? And you began to write, I am. Most people tend to to respond to that question, I am, by citing their identity with their position or with their work, rather than really who they are and who they are in relationship to others. Of course, the goal of the exercise for Christians is to point to the very basic foundation of who we are by saying, I am a child of God. The most significant factor about the shepherd is that he or she is also a sheep. A sheep in need of guidance, leadership, and feeding. As a child of God, there is a need to develop that relationship. One of the most amazing passages of scripture is found in John's Gospel, John chapter 13, where we find Jesus just about ready to complete his earthly ministry and go to the cross, we find him there washing his disciples' feet. Jesus' ability to provide this ministry was based on the security of his relationship with his Father. In John 13, verse 3, we have these words. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God, and that he was returning to God. So he got up. He had come from God and he was returning to God. And so he got up and he began to minister. Jesus' ministry flowed from who, who he was. There is something here for us today. With so much emphasis coming in contemporary literature and Christian literature upon leadership styles and leadership roles, so much of this emphasis as if a pastor could put on a particular leadership style as one would put on a coat, there is a need to be reminded that ministry flows from our relationship to the Father. Jesus could provide the lowly service of washing the feet of his disciples because he knew who he was. He had come from the Father and he was returning to the Father. When we are secure in our relationship with the Father, we can serve. Pastors, watch and take heed to yourselves. You may need to spend time in the Word and in prayer with this most basic personal relationship. Pastors also need to be encouraged to understand more about who they are in relation to other people and who they are in their own psyche and in their own personality. I would encourage pastors not to be afraid of certain tools that could be used to help them to gain a greater understanding of their own personality and, and the kind of a person they are. On two occasions, I have gone through the Myers-Briggs 
analysis. Some of you here have obviously gone through that as well. While it has changed in terms of how, um, I, what changed, the outcome changed in some cases, um, it basically remained the same. And what it taught me was not only some things about myself and how I relate to people, but also to be better able to understand other people and their temperament. Who are you? Take time to understand your strengths and your weaknesses and guard your life. Give these to our Lord who has the great task of character development and enabling us to demonstrate the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Guard your life so that nothing will sabotage the process sabotage the process of the Holy Spirit's work in your life. Issues relating to poor anger management, coping with depression, and sexual deviance present themselves in shepherds as well as sheep. Seek to understand yourself and guard and watch your life. Some of the strategies of guarding your own life perhaps would begin with a self-acceptance only made possible because of the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. I encourage pastors to share their journey with a close friend or their spouse. I encourage pastors to enlist prayer support. What I'm about to say isn't popular. There are enemies within the psyche or within the person, the total being, however we understand it. But there are also enemies without. One of the reasons this isn't popular is because we have yet, I think, to understand, and perhaps we never will understand, the reality of the spiritual warfare that exists against pastors and Christian leaders. And there are those places, perhaps even tonight, where there are those who would gather not in Jesus' name, who would pray to an enemy of ours, seeking the downfall of Christian marriage and leadership, Beware, watch, develop an intercessory prayer life. There are enemies. Take care of yourself with proper rest and nutrition and exercise. I don't say that lightly. I encourage you. I was so pleased when someone said to me, you look so much healthier than you did a year ago. It's true. It was a very difficult time in my own uh, physical journey about a year and a half ago. But it took time. I had to take time for myself. And I don't know about you, but I know when most pastors find it difficult to take time for themselves. We find it a little easier to be washing feet than we do to present our own feet to be washed. And with Peter, we're more apt to say, you're not going to wash my feet. Take care. Jesus' ministry to others flowed from his clear sense of identity. There is a need to be reminded that the Lord has called you to serve him as a shepherd. This call has been confirmed by God's people who recognize gifts for ministry in you. Jesus welcomed the ministry of the towel and the basin, but he had to surrender it completely in the Garden of Gethsemane. There was a cross that was at the center of his ministry. When he washed the disciples' feet, he allowed himself to be vulnerable. It was his voluntary humiliation that rebuked the pride of his disciples. The disciples, only moments before, had been arguing over who would be the greatest in the kingdom. Remember the context? Jesus got up with the towel and the basin. He provided this ministry without words. He was not concerned about his own personal reputation. Sometimes, I believe, we clearly send the message to others that we are very self-sufficient. 
There are various tools that have been developed to enable a leader to understand his or her leadership style. Issues of decision making, styles of conflict management are highlighted in this process. The church, in fact, has a key role to play in assisting leaders to, to define their primary gifting. In Ephesians, we are reminded that our Lord gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be teacher, pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service. In guarding your life, there are spiritual issues. There are psychological issues. There are personality issues. There are physical issues and health issues. But there must be a resolve not to succumb to the temptation of what I would once call, and once what I used to call, in fact when I was here as a student at Acadia, what we called the ministerial reserve. <laughs> and as a young pastor going out to the field, I remember some of the people saying to me, Oh, the older ministers. There was always that distance between them, that ministerial reserve. But I want us not to succumb to what I would call a new temptation of what I might see and have seen in those who are coming forward and those who are in ministry. And aren't you glad there will be at least an opportunity for a couple of comments or questions before I say this? What once was the professional reserve or the ministerial reserve, I now see something called the professional ministry. And I would pray that God would help us to keep us from that sense of just seeing ourselves as the professional minister. Our pastoral call comes from God and is affirmed by his people. We need to learn to listen to them but that indeed is another subject and a very key one in tending and caring for sheep. There can come, I believe as well, in terms of guarding your life, something that I have heard on a regular basis from pastors, where it can also appear to some of them that the church becomes almost an, in an adversarial uh, position to them and to their family, where they need to protect themselves, as it were, from the church or from... Um, invasions upon their privacy. And this again, I think, is coming from this whole area of where we need to come to grips with the fact that we are professionals and we need to behave in a professional manner and carry out our ministry in a professional manner. But I confess to you, and some of you I hope will react to this, and please talk to me about it afterward, but I confess to you tonight, I find it difficult with this professional ministry and separating that from one's personal life and ministry. As I understand it, it is a composite package. I understand clearly that there has to be lines drawn at times to protect one's own privacy and one's own life. But I'm a little bit afraid that sometimes those who would insist not only on one day off but on two days off a week, or those who are insisting upon no one interrupting them at any time during the meal, and not giving any kind of an address or telephone number when they go away on holidays, that there's something there that needs to be worked on. I don't have the answer to it. I cite it. I understand the tension, but we need to be working on this. The pastor who clearly understands the key to his personal identity or her personal identity as a child of God called by him to serve as a shepherd among his sheep and that, con and that calling confirmed, that person can begin to focus on caring for sheep without a preoccupation for himself or herself. It is a rich privilege for a pastor to tend the church of which the Holy Spirit has made that one an overseer. The pastor needs to recognize that the church is not to be seen. 
as anything other than the bride of Christ, even at times when we can't see very clearly that image. The second thing that I want to emphasize in this lecture is not only must you guard your own life, but when you are called to be the pastor of a specific flock, you need to bond with your people. Bond with your people. Let us be clear that the reason we are called to be shepherds is so that God's people will become mature disciples of Jesus Christ, reaching out to make disciples for him among all peoples. The relationship between the shepherd and the sheep is such that it requires bonding. And bonding must take place at the beginning stages of the relationship and should continue throughout the relationship. I know of a recent graduate from Acadia Divinity <coughs> College who decided not to return to this campus to go through with his friends and to receive uh, his graduation uh, degree. He decided rather to stay in and among his new flock because of the sudden death of a senior deacon in that church. I can tell you that while he sacrificed personally for himself, you may or may not, or I may or may not have made that decision, but I can tell you that he bonded with his sheep. And they knew, they began to know that his priority was not just in himself. There is much to be said and could be said, and I would love the opportunity in another setting to talk about how churches need to bond with pastors. That's another lecture. But I want us to focus tonight on how pastors can attempt to bond with their sheep. Each church body, each church family is distinct, unique. Rural churches, town churches, suburban churches, <coughs> urban and rural those that are somewhere in between. When the new pastor is called, it is critical that bonding occur between himself or herself and the church. A passage of scripture that God has used greatly in my own life is in Acts chapter 8. An account of Philip who was told by God to leave Samaria where there had been a tremendous outpouring of the Spirit and to go southward on a desert road from Jerusalem to Gaza. There were many powerful lessons that God has used in my own life. But as I reflect with you on this text tonight, on this whole matter of bonding and God's direction of calling you into the responsibility of shepherding a particular people, I'd like to turn your attention to the first word that the Spirit of God told Philip. And you recall the account of how Philip on that old, dusty desert road going down from Jerusalem to Gaza. As he's there, uh, running, walking, I don't know just what the story is, but he's there on his own without a vehicle. He's on an old, dusty road. And he sees a chariot. And I don't know what you, you think of when you think of chariots, and some of you might think of the Roman chariot. It wasn't like that. It was more probably, uh, more like a, a carriage. And there was an Ethiopian eunuch who was returning after having been at Jerusalem, and he had a copy of the prophet's writings of Isaiah. And he was reading, but the Spirit said to Philip, and this is a very key phrase, go to that chariot and stay near it. The intent of the Greek in this passage is that Philip would join himself, or that Philip would glue himself to the chariot, that he would bond with it. In ministry, we are called to moving chariots. Admittedly, some of the church chariots may not be moving very fast. <laughs> While others are busily carrying out their own agendas and their own ministries as the new shepherd arrives, and quite frankly, they're not all sure that they want him or her involved in everything. Philip took the initiative to join himself to the chariot. He didn't start by saying, oh, by the way, I've been in Samaria and it's been a great revival up there and, and didn't say anything. In fact, the first thing that he did was to exercise a ministry of listening. 
A ministry of listening which was not followed with pronouncements or sermons or teachings, but with a question. He said to him, do you understand what you're reading? We are told that beginning with the same passage, Philip told the Ethiopian the good news about Jesus. A significant key to ministry is to bond with people in such a way that we can help them to do theological reflection on the person of Jesus Christ in the midst of where they find themselves in life. We begin where they are, not where we are. We begin where they are, and we focus upon our Lord. Sometimes, from the position I am in, I answer the telephone. Other times, the secretary does. But when I answer the telephone sometimes, I find that on the other end is a pastor. A pastor who's not happy. A pastor who's reciting to me how he or she feels as if they're being treated as a hireling rather than as a shepherd. The realities of life and the difficulties that sometimes occur in the relationship between shepherd and sheep are real. They are real. And there are not small or trite answers to the relationship and how we can solve some of these difficulties. But I believe that if real bonding can occur in the early stages of ministry, that indeed that person will become a shepherd and not a hireling. Jesus said that the hireling runs from the sheep when trouble comes. The hireling runs for his own life, not protecting the sheep. He runs because he cares nothing for the sheep. If we are going to have effective ministries with God's people, we must bond with the sheep. We must love and affirm these people as individuals and as a church family. I am always amazed with the number of shepherds who sense God's call to the Truro Triangle, as I will call it. That is Truro, Halifax, and Kentville. People who sometimes get bonded with an area, with an area but are they really bonded with sheep? I'm also amazed at how little sometimes God seems to be calling people to Andy Ganesh and Cape Breton and Newfoundland and some of the more difficult places. And I have to tell you that I whispered a prayer when I left the Annapolis Valley that went something like this. Dear Lord, if you ever call me back to the Annapolis Valley, all you'll have to do is whisper. <laughs> So I'm, a, I'm very conscious of this triangle. But I would encourage you that Philip bonded with the Ethiopian by asking a question. Bonding is sharing life with another in such a way that the two are mutually supportive and protective. Bonding begins as the choice of the shepherd. The choice of the shepherd to love God's people. I recognize, and believe me, I recognize all too well from my position that there can be unhealthy bonds of codependency. There is a danger. But I believe that it is worth the risk of entering into a caring relationship with one's flock. Otherwise, one might just have too much professional reserve or professional ministry. There is mutuality, but the shepherd keeps his or her ministry identity sharply in focus. The shepherd must be transparent and vulnerable in this process. If the shepherd is cold and detached, he or she will never become the shepherd of that flock. It is a balancing act, but the shepherd must seek ways to bond with the sheep. Begin with listening and end with listening, and carry it out as a process. Every church is in a context. Listen carefully to the story of the church. Visit key leaders in the church to listen to the story, to its strengths and to its struggles in the past. Exegete the community. Seek to identify yourself to key community leadership as well. Listen with me to these quotes about the value of listening. 
Ralph Nichols says, the most basic of all human needs is the need to understand and to be understood. M. Scott Peck says, you cannot truly listen to anyone and do anything else at the same time. There is a Turkish proverb, if speaking is silver, then listening is gold. Spurgeon said, now a man cannot listen to another while he will have all the talk and discourse to himself. David Barkin said, easy listening only exists on the radio. <laughs> Dean Rusk said, the best way to persuade people is with your ears, by listening to them. Carl Menninger said, listening is a magnetic and strange thing, a creative force. The friend who listens to us, the, rather the friends who listen to us, are the ones we move toward. When we are listened to, it creates us, makes us unfold and expand. And James said, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak. In the beginning stages and throughout one's pastoral ministry in a given context, it is critical to listen and be attentive to God's agenda amongst his people. Try in the bonding process to listen to the people without constantly telling them about where you have just come from. Comparing them to your previous flock. Some pastors are guilty of this by saying, well, when I was in such and such a place, we did it this way. Listen to your people and endure, and sometimes you will have to, endure the praise or the criticism of the previous pastor. They are telling you something about the style of pastor they had and the expectations they have of you. You may think they are talking about the previous leadership. <laughs> Make a conscious decision.